We appreciate all feedback and responses. Now to get started, I would like to introduce today's moderator for the Amplifying Youth Voices, Examples of Youth Adult Partnership Initiative webinar, Namisha Timsina. Namisha is the Workforce Analyst from the Division of Youth Services. Please join me in welcoming Namisha. Thank you so much, Jermel, for those housekeeping rules, and good afternoon and good morning for those joining on the West Coast. Thank you all for taking time out of your day to join us. My name is Namisha Tamsina, and I'm a Workforce Analyst at the Division of Youth Services here at the Department of Labor, and I will be your moderator for today. Next slide, please. Oop. Thank you. During today's webinar, Amplifying Youth Voices, Examples of Youth Adult Partnership Initiatives, I invite you all to ask any and all of your questions in that Q&A chat. Our agenda is as follows. First, my colleague Lillian Fix will spend a few minutes talking about the great work that the Department of Labor's Employment and Training Administration's Youth Systems Building Academy accomplished, and she will review the brand new Youth Systems Building Academy compendium. I highly recommend that you check out this incredible document, and we will put the compendium link in the chat. Next, we will review some of the frameworks of youth engagement before introducing three incredible communities. Then, three communities that were all participating in the YSB Academy will share how they develop their youth adult partnerships. And then, after those three communities share their phenomenal presentations, I highly recommend that you stick around for the Q&A where you will have the chance to have all of your questions answered. And finally, we will end with a closeout. Now, I'd like to turn it over to Lillian Fix, my colleague in the Division of Youth Services. Lillian? Hello. Um, hi, as Misha mentioned, I am Lillian Fix. I am a white woman with medium length, straight, dark blonde hair. Um, I will ask for next slide, please. So woven into this ongoing conversation about youth voice has been the Youth Systems Building Academy, which I'll refer to as the Academy. Um, not only was our incredible speaker from the first Amplifying Youth Voices webinar, Madison Dahl Witten, also a speaker at the Academy, but the communities you'll be hearing from today were participants in the Academy, and they'll be talking about some of their work that came out of their youth systems building experience. So we wanted to first take a step back and tell you what was the Academy and then tell you about the Youth Systems Building Academy Compendium, uh, which is this great new resource that can not only help you with amplifying youth voices in your community, um, but also with broader youth systems building efforts. Um, next slide. So following a competitive self-nomination process, DOL selected 19 communities across two cohorts to participate in the Academy, which took place in 2023 and 2024 this year. Um, each of the communities consisted of their local workforce board and additional community partners ranging from education, justice, other human services systems, um, to foundations, labor unions, among others. Um, each cohort received a six-month training and technical assistance opportunity with um, two in-person convenings and recurring coaching sessions. The purpose of the academy was to align systems so that there are no wrong doors for youth. Um, so this means that systems are designed such that youth are not required to navigate on their own to find the proper channels to access the different services they need, but that regardless of which system youth initially connect to, whether that's through education, justice, other human services programs, et cetera, they can easily access the array of services that support um, their needs the most. Um, the Academy generated quite a wealth of information uh, through shared knowledge, lessons learned, best practices, community examples, et cetera. And all this is packaged up in the new publication we're calling the Compendium of Community Accomplishments. Next slide. Um, the Compendium is an interactive document that you can access through Workforce GPS. Um, it's linked on this slide and I believe is also being shared in the chat. Um, it includes a section of highlights and accomplishments by theme for the participating communities, as well as individual community profiles where you can dig into each community's work at the Academy. And the resource also includes advice and lessons learned for communities looking to begin or continue their own systems building efforts. So keep that in mind as you explore the resource. Next slide. So obviously we're all here today to continue continue the ongoing discussion about youth voice, which is a topic that is uh, integrated throughout the compendium and youth voice is obviously an important component of uh, systems building efforts. Um, when thinking about incorporating youth voice into your community, it's important to consider that this work is not done in isolation, but along with systems building work in topics such as data, outreach, partnerships, services, and more. 
So before we hear from the communities about the great work they've done in amplifying youth voices, we wanted to briefly review a little bit of the broader context of work that was also supported by the Academy. So I'm gonna to touch on just a single highlight from each of the topic areas I mentioned um, over the next few slides. There's not only more information on each slide that you can dig into, but you can read even more about these examples in the compendium. Next slide. So first in data, um, just highlighting Lake County, Illinois, cataloged over 600 youth serving organizations, training programs and employment opportunities on an interactive map, which users can use to connect with service providers. And they also use uh, data to improve their outreach strategies by updating their estimations of youth disconnection in their county. Next slide. And speaking of outreach, uh, Omaha created an entire marketing and outreach campaign with customizable logos, messaging, and social media. And their campaign materials have assisted with getting the word out to youth, parents, and employers about training and educational opportunities. Next slide. In partnerships, Portland held one-on-one -on -one meetings with 90 partners to learn about what each partner does in their community. Then they drafted a Memorandum of Understanding or MOU to support their new and ongoing partnerships with community organizations. Next slide. And for services, Denver, Colorado began a co-location pilot program intended to serve both in-school and out-of-school youth. And they also identified other local programs and resources that serve youth in their community through an asset mapping activity. So they knew what other resources were available in their community to support young people. Next slide. And circling back to Youth Voice, uh, Southeast Michigan began incorporating Youth Voice in planning workforce events, engaging youth ambassadors to provide peer support, and surveyed youth about outreach and, and recruitment. So all really, really great work. Um, so when you're listening to the communities today, think about amplifying youth voices in your community within the broader context of building a no wrong door system with data, outreach partnerships, services, and beyond. Um, so maybe there's an opportunity to amplify youth voices in your outreach efforts like Southeast Michigan did, or maybe there are certain partnerships your organization could engage with that could further support youth voice in your community. So with that, I will one more time remind you to explore the community examples in the compendium, and I will pass it right back off to Misha. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Lillian, for sharing that. Again, please check out the compendium. There is so much greatness that the Academy produced. And if you have any questions about the compendium, please ask them in the Q&A box. We will be sure to be answering them during the Q&A section at the end. Um, next slide, please. So this webinar is a sequel to the Amplifying Youth Voices, Navigating Youth Engagement from Advisors to Leaders session. We will drop that event in the chat. And during the first installment of our Amplifying Youth Voices series, participants explored the different frameworks of youth engagement in the decision-making processes of workforce development. And as a quick refresher, some of the youth engagement policies that were shared include, next slide, please, trauma-informed practices. So a trauma-informed practice is where programs, organizations, and systems realize the widespread impact of trauma and understand the potential paths for recovery. This includes acknowledging that there is trauma that not everybody has gone through, but recognizing the signs and symptoms in our clients, staff, families, and others. Next slide, please. Um, another principle for youth engagement was healing-centered engagement shared by Madison Dalwitten in our previous uh, webinar. This approach to youth engagement is asset-based and rooted in collective healing as well and well-being for young people and their adult allies. Um, one thing that Madison talked about in our last webinar that I think is very pertinent to today's um, webinar is healing-centered engagement includes meaning, and it means that opportunities for young people to build on their assets and really think about their purpose. And it also means that providers are keeping sight of why they too are engaged in this work. Next slide, please. And another principle to youth engagement that our great speaker Madison Dowitton shared was positive youth development. I'm sure you'll hear a lot about this one today. This framework is an intentional pro-social approach that engages young people within their communities, schools, organizations, peer groups, and families in a manner that is productive and constructive. It can look like providing opportunities and fostering positive relationships through recognizing, utilizing, and enhancing a, enhancing a young person's strength. Next slide. Next slide, please. If you would like to review more frameworks of youth engagement, please find the link to Navigating Youth Engagement from Advisors to Leaders webinar in the chat. 
I think you all have heard a lot about the principles of youth engagement, but now it is time to introduce the YSB Academy communities. But before I pass it along, I would like to direct you all to the Q&A box one more time. If you have a specific question for any of our communities, please enter your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We will have a few minutes set aside for each individual community to answer your specific questions after their presentation wraps up. All right, thank you for listening. And now I would like to introduce you all to Workforce Boulder County's Kelly Strong. Kelly? Hi there, everybody. You can go ahead and change the slide. Awesome, thank you. So our presentation is called Nothing About Us Without Us, Youth Listening Sessions from Workforce Boulder County. And I'll get into what that means here in just a moment. Next slide, please. My name is Kelly Strong. I'm a community educator here at Workforce Boulder County, and I was just part of the wonderful and incredible team that was able to travel to Washington, D.C. and be part of the Youth Systems Building Academy. Prior to becoming a workforce professional here at Workforce Boulder County, I was also a K-12 educator, and that very much informs my approach to this work, um, and I think was a, a good voice to have on our team. Next slide, please. Thank you. So I wanted to begin by just sharing the vision statement that we created for our work in the Youth Systems Building Academy during our time together in Washington, D.C. with our team. So I won't fully read the vision statement, but I do want to emphasize a couple parts of it. So we really wanted to empower our youth to engage in leadership and decision making. We really believed that, like the visual says here, that youth matter, that they have perspectives and experiences that are worth sharing. And it's really our job as work workforce professionals working with young adults to listen when they have these ideas to share with us. We also believe in this platform or creating a platform for young adults to realize their full potential in what we called an opportunistic workforce system. So we acknowledge that opportunities existed for some youth in our community, but we wanted to make sure that we could create opportunities for all youth. And part of that process involved fostering a supportive environment. So really providing a space and a time for youth to speak their minds and for us to hear them. And through that, our goal is to be, uh, enable youth to become confident leaders who are actively improving their communities and shaping a brighter future. A great part of the work we did through the YSB Academy was to um, think about ways that we could create systems and structures that would inspire youth to think about a future in Boulder County and what that might look like for them. So at the core of what we really believe is, like I mentioned, this idea that youth matter, that they are the experts in their own experience, and we need to believe their perspective. So we decided to call this presentation Nothing About Us Without Us, as that became a driving force in our work with young adults. We became really aware that we could not continue to enforce and create policies and systems for young people without the perspectives of young people informing the choices that we made. Next slide, please. Thank you. So what we decided to do as part of our work with the YSB Academy was to really harness youth voice. And that was part of our goal from the very beginning. We decided that we couldn't make these changes or to implement these things without really hearing from youth first. So youth voice was the very beginning of our work from the, from the start. Thank you for the, the laughs at my image here. I think it's good. So what we started with was what we called a Youth Impact Summit. And we partnered with our coach through the YSB Academy, uh, Dr. Nicole, to create the materials and the structure for this initially virtual session where we intended to bring youth together and ask them questions about what was going well, what wasn't going well, what changes they would make if they had the opportunity to impact the systems and structures that they existed between. So I know that Namisha mentioned this, so I wanna highlight the idea of positive youth development. Positive youth development has really become a driving force of our work um, and was part of my work as a teacher working with students in the K-12 setting. So part of that positive youth development framework you could see was part of our vision statement. And we wanted to emphasize the idea of a strengths-based framework. Again, not focusing on deficits and what youth didn't have, but the ideas that they wanted to share with us. 
Um, this session that we created in the Youth Impact Summit started out as being about a two and a half hour long kind of larger gathering where we promoted ideas and shared thoughts and then asked for feedback from youth. Um, Dr. Nicole helped us to put together a build book that asked really great questions, seeking to understand pain points that youth experienced and some of the things that they wanted to improve. Okay. Um, along those ideas were really the emphasis on words like inspiration. What were some moments in your, you know, earlier childhood that kind of led you towards what you believe to be your future here in Boulder County? We really wanted to emphasize the idea of both empowerment and advocacy, which are really integral to the ideas of positive youth development to promote, you know, youth voice. And then of course, imagination to break down barriers of systems that we exist in currently and hope to find ways to overcome some of those barriers. So all of this was a really great plan. Um, the problem was we struggled to get youth to come to the table. So our first series of Youth Impact Summits were very lightly attended. Um, we only had five students or five youth who came to our very first Youth Impact Summit. And then we scheduled a couple other additional in-person sessions in that same month of October, 2023. So what we decided to do was to have a big pivot in our recognition that we needed to go to youth rather than asking them to come to us. So what this pivot looked like or this change is we went from our youth impact summits to what we then started to call youth listening sessions. So beginning in late 2023 and into early 2024, we took our show on the road and met youth where they were at. So we attended um, sessions that were comprised of youth groups that were already existing and when they had scheduled meetings and times. And we were very intentional to reach out to diverse youth across Boulder County, not just focusing on one type of, of youth over another. So we did engage with in-school youth. We engaged with in-school youth and out-of-school youth. We attended some meetings of youth boards in some of the towns across of our county. And we really were intentional to um, seek out the perspectives and feedback of underserved communities, including youth who attended alternative schools in some of our rural areas. We went to a shelter that houses and supports homeless youth across Boulder County. We engage with LGBTQIA youth throughout Boulder County and got feedback from those very diverse perspectives. Um, the outcome of this major shift was that youth felt really comfortable engaging with us um, in their more familiar environments. And what we learned from that was that context matters, that it was really difficult to ask youth to come to us with all of the other obligations and responsibilities they had committed to. They didn't know who we were, they didn't know what we were looking for, and they didn't know why we wanted to ask them these questions. So partnering with existing groups of youth proved very effective to us. Next slide, please. I wanted to share just a little bit of the feedback that we received from these listening sessions. I think that speak to how grateful um, youth became when they understood why we were there and what we were starting to ask them. So I think this quote really illustrates the idea that youth wanted to be asked about these opportunities for career and workforce advancement, but they often don't have the opportunity. And there often aren't, you know, well-meaning adults who are there in the room just to listen to them and to not tell them what to do. Um, the youth that we engaged with really appreciated our interest and their engagement with them. And I think the other key part to this is that we as adults and as practitioners often don't know what youth need or want unless we ask them. And what we realized was that they had a lot to share. Next slide, please. Thank you. This is just one additional quote that really spoke to the impact of our time spent with youth. Um, and I think this is really the energy that took us into our next steps and also elaborated sort of the why, why we were there, why we were asking these questions and why we were building these very intentional partnerships with youth. I'm gonna give you just a moment to read this one. I know it's a little bit longer. <laughs> Next slide, please. Awesome. 
So I know that I'm talking quite broadly about what the heck it was we did in these youth listening sessions, and I'd like to emphasize some of the key components that I think made them very effective, including the what, the why, and the how around these listening sessions at a whole as a whole. So one of the things that really helped us were the questions that we asked. And I have a couple examples of those on the slide here. So we asked youth to think about a time that they felt inspired or excited about a potential career or future in Boulder County and how that made them feel empowered or have agency within themselves. And then alongside that question, we also asked them to think about some crucial things, factors, components that might help to build better career pathways between ourselves, right, and alongside or with Boulder County youth, right? There's a difference between us making decisions and offering programs and resources to youth in our community um, and the big difference between that and the, the, the partnership or that positive youth development principle of youth as partners who have a seat at the table, right? We're not creating things and running ideas by them. We are engaging as equal partners with them. I also wanted to share some of the context we provided to help them think um, in a broader way, as well as to inspire some creative thinking. So these boxes you see on the screen are reflective of some of the tenets of collaboration we shared with youth to promote this creative thinking during these listening sessions. We wanted them to understand that no idea was too big, that they could build on the ideas of one another, and that we wanted to just think of ideas to throw out there. We didn't have to fully flush them out. We wanted to just have a really solid brainstorm where there was no idea that was wrong or, you know, out of, out of context for us. And then finally, we really broke down some barriers. I think something that we learned quite a bit in this session was that students and youth know a whole lot about the structures and systems they exist within. So when we promoted this idea of, you know, what if you didn't have to go to school for eight hours a day? What if you didn't have to sit in this chair? What if they were able to really broaden their thinking and come up with some new ideas? Next slide, please. So what we did from there, what we did in these sessions is we really empathized with youth. And I think that that's really critical to building partnerships is not thinking that we are above or beyond, but that we can work together with youth. So by building empathy, we identified the true needs of youth. We identified their experiences. We dug deep into their motivations and we were able to really understand some of the problems that they faced within the structures and systems they exist within. Next slide, please. So after joining all these meetings and going and attending all of these um, youth groups, we decided to analyze the data we had collected through a design thinking protocol. For those of you that aren't familiar, design thinking is a problem solving approach that prioritizes the needs of the end user. So in our case, it was youth in Boulder County. It's human centered, it's iterative, and it's solution based, really focusing on the root causes of a problem. So we spent a lot of time in that empathy building phase, collecting all of our data. And from there, we use that information to define the problems. And then, only then, were we able to move on to creating some solutions. So in our design thinking session, we identified and categorized youth feedback, which reflected some of those underlying needs. These categories you see on the left reflect kind of the big ideas that came out of our design thinking session and the categories through which we organized youth feedback. Some of these might actually be a little bit universal. What we discovered was that youth across our counties in different situations and different, different circumstances um, really brought about the same ideas. So some of these concepts might even be relevant to the youth across the country where you are working with them. They wanted core skill development. They wanted access to career pathways. They felt pressure to go to college. They felt a lot of barriers around youth specific employment and the lack of experience that youth had when applying for work. And something else they really emphasized was this idea of a need for mentorship and supportive communities in their career building process. Next slide, please. So our next steps came to be, what do we do with this information? What do we do with this feedback we collected and these ideas that youth have shared with us? So we decided to take it a step further and to think about how we might begin to design some structures and systems to address these really specific youth pain points and to create opportunity. 
In the design thinking process, they call this the ideate phase. Next slide, please. So where we are today and what we're continuing to work on is to really dive deep into those pain points that youth express to us across our county and to address those needs with specific programs and structures that we can help provide and create alongside youth. So we heard loud and clear that youth wanted core skill development and life skills to be taught to them explicitly, either in a school setting or outside of that. And this understanding that core skills are life skills. These are things that people need to be successful in school and beyond. So what we've developed since then is an executive functioning workshop series that really targets some of those core skills, among which are inhibition control, working memory, and cognitive flexibility. And we're in the process of piloting this right now. We have offered it in two school settings as of today, um, one in a special ed classroom, a life skills class in one of our local school districts, and the other in an alternative school setting in the other large school district based here in Boulder County. So this partnership with local school districts has also come out of our work through the Youth Systems Building Academy, understanding and recognizing that while WIOA funding kind of limits our capacity to work with in-school youth, there's still a really significant need for these types of things to be offered to our in-school youth. So that's part of what we're doing now. Our young adult team is also incorporating, incorporating a great deal of that youth feedback. And we have engaged in partnership with, again, one of our large local school districts through an Opportunity Now grant that's providing a really dedicated member of our workforce team to be in schools and provide some of that mentorship, coaching, and core skill development for young adults throughout Boulder County. Um, please ask any questions that you have. Uh, I think some of the big takeaways that I'd like to emphasize is we really want to go slow to go fast. And while it seems to some of us that we've taken this process over the course of a really long time and not really come up with much tangible to show for it, we've learned a lot and we've created really effective and important partnerships that are going to continue to carry us forward. Thank you so much for having us. Um, and we look forward to continued work with DOL. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, I think I speak for everyone that's giving all of the applause. This was phenomenal. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, we had some really cool questions and I think we can go to the next slide for questions. Thank you. Okay, so the first question we got was, could you please tell us more of what the build book consisted of? Yeah, um, thanks and for is this. Oh yeah, really quickly. Oh, I great. wanted to also add to their question. They said, could this be a tool or resource that can be shared with attendees? Is this something you can share? Yeah, it's definitely something we can share. Um, I will mention that it has definitely taken the design thinking iteration process into consideration. I think what we started with was way too much and it was way too big. Um, and we were trying to be a little bit too prescriptive with these interactions with youth and kind of, you know, telling them which direction to go and sort of guiding their thinking to uh, I think too much of an extent. So what we've kind of evolved into is a much more condensed version of what we called the build book. It's much shorter. It asks some of those really great questions that I shared with you earlier on in my presentation. And really it just creates this space for youth to speak and for us to listen. So yeah, we can definitely share that. But um, I think a lot of what I shared with you really reflects kind of the core of what's in the build book, but I'd be happy to share it. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I think the second question that we also got, we can quickly answer before we move on is, what was the age group that you targeted in your youth summits? I love that. That's a great question. Um, initially, we were planning to target high school youth. Well, really the youth we serve in our young adult program. So 16 through 24, um, we engage with high school aged youth and then, you know, younger adults through some of those other organizations we partnered with. But um <laughs> What was really cool is when we would show up at some of these meetings, we would find that there were younger brothers and sisters there who wanted to be a part of things and wanted to share their perspective. So we actually had some really insightful conversations with middle school aged youth. And I think that that taught us that this concept of career exploration really can be started much younger and much earlier than many of us think. Um, and that they have ideas and thoughts even when they're not in that high school phase, applying to colleges, thinking about trade school, thinking about what comes next after high school. Um, and so I would really emphasize that as well, really kind of 
targeting or thinking about having conversations with, you know, even youth that are under the age of, of high school. Thank you so much, Kelly. And thank you, Kelly, for sharing all of the hard work being done out of Boulder County. Another round of applause. Um, there's so much investment in young people being done in Boulder County, and it's great to see and hear. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Chenna Tucker from Workforce Development, Oswego County. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, first, I want to say, Kelly, great job with you and your team. It, it seems like everything you're doing, you're saying we haven't gotten much out of it. For me, as we're kind of beginning this process, I'm like, oh, my God, this is fantastic. And I can kind of see where with our plan that we have, where we're going to be going and probably be visiting in, in probably six to eight months with what we have uh, planned for, for today. But uh, but good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Gina Tucker, and I uh, am in Oswego County, which is in central New York. And so a little bit of context for that. It is a rural community. We have about 120,000 um, population, and we have um, some issues in, in the rural population as well as with, with poverty as it hovers around 18%. So the specific things that we look at really come from that lens. Um, and a lot of the work that we've done over the last several years has been um, some anti-poverty coalition work. And so um, next slide, please. And so I am the member of the 2024 spring cohort, and I'm a previous Workforce Development Board director, but two years ago I moved into philanthropy, so now I'm the executive director of a private foundation uh, that serves just Oswego County. Um, but on our group, we uh, had uh, you know several, um, we had a member from our, the current executive director of workforce development in Oswego County. Uh, we had our uh, community-based organizations, Oswego County Opportunities, and then our local youth bureau here that serve youth. So the good news is, is that we've been doing a lot of this work in, in system building for a long time. So we did have some really great partnerships um, that we had built over the last um, decade. And so moving into this work was kind of a natural flow from the work that we had done as we did a lot of work in the adult uh, population, but we really felt like it was time to focus on, on our youth. Um, so the one thing that we saw, the challenge that we had in looking at this vision of this no wrong door and this seamless uh, service of system was that we needed to work on our communication and a big challenge that we had was really the clarity of our messaging um, as our workforce development system. Um, so next slide, please. So from the beginning, as we were working as a group, our big questions that we had and working with our, our workforce partners was where are the youth? How do we connect with them? And how do we build our messaging to make sure that it really is going to, uh, to appeal and to inspire our local youth? Um, we didn't really understand, again, what are their career interests? Do they feel that they have a place within our community? Uh, do they feel that they have a future within this community? Um, so we had really a lot of questions uh, going into this that we felt that we wanted to address as part of the work that we were doing that would help us to kind of design and develop programming. Um, and again, I love what Kelly was saying about these listening sessions, and that's great insight for us uh, on top of the work that we're currently doing to add some of those. And we have a plan that I'll share uh, with the group as we move forward. Um, but really, it was a perfect time for us to do this youth system building effort. We have a huge opportunity in front of us. Um, and uh, within the last year and a half, we have had an announcement from uh, Micron that we have a new chip fab plant that's about the size of 40 football fields uh, that's going to be breaking ground in, in 2025. And that's 10 miles outside of our county, of Oswego County. They're projecting about 9,000 jobs just within Micron and about 50,000 jobs, ancillary jobs to serve and support uh, that initiative. And so really the time for us is, is really exciting, but the time is, is definitely now. And any of those who are in workforce understand that you know, we already were in a workforce crisis and now we're looking at this huge boom that's coming. So all of us are just like, okay, we have to, let's move forward with this. So exciting time and definitely a great, a great uh, impetus for us to, to move forward. So uh, next slide. 
So as we started to, to kind of mind map all that we were looking at, and again, the questions that we had bringing into this, we broke out some of these strategic elements for ourselves, right? So mind mapping and looking at making sure that we, we do this often, particularly in the adults, but again, really wanting to target and make sure that we've got the youth in mind, looking at labor market alignment, um, understanding our outreach, and again, that unified messaging and that no wrong door, and then how do we share those resources with our local partnership, youth voice being a huge part of this. And again, I love the things that, that Kelly had shared and, and we have some strategies that we're looking at, but as anybody knows, you can have the best plan, but sometimes you have to be really flexible in how you orchestrate that because sometimes the best ideas, you have to shift and pivot, as she said, to, to figure out what's really gonna make it work. And we've got some ideas with that. Um, partnerships, again, mapping the services that we have. So, uh, and collecting and um, looking at the data and really studying the youth perspectives, and that was gonna be important to the work that we did. Um, so from there, as part of the youth system building, we had developed our action plan and our intended outcomes. But one thing we, I mean, we obviously knew we needed data and we needed help, right? With a workforce system and, you know, sometimes the resources aren't always there as, as you hoped. And so we were just kind of doing a landscape scan to understand um, who was going to be able to help and partner us with moving some of these initiatives and helping support our efforts. Uh, next slide, please. So as we started working together as a group, uh, we felt that the first place that we needed to go is, you know, to look at our system network to create some of the um, our goals as well as to create buy-in. So these were the goals that we articulated as a group. We felt that they were some things that we all could achieve, um, and then we developed the action plan to support that. Um, next slide. And these were our strategies, right? So the first was to collect and share the data. Um, so what we looked at with this is um, we knew that we wanted to conduct a study and looking at youth employment experiences from ages 16 to 24 so that we could use the data uh, and inform our decision-making for our employment strategies. Um, building partnership infrastructure and aligned youth-focused services. Um, again, identifying youth populations and mapping these services. Ensure alignment of programs and partners across the county to streamline services for youth and identify gaps, right? So these are part of the things that we were we were mapping out for our next 18 month plan that we wanted to put together. Um, incorporating youth voice, we currently have a uh, youth advisory council that's been a part of the Workforce Development Board for a number of years, um, but what we haven't had there is really a youth voice. So we wanted to look at recruiting diverse youth members and integrate their feedback and decision making and literally look at paid youth roles, potentially using paid work experience and create opportunities for youth leadership and program development and marketing efforts. And then um, to align uh, the, excuse me, marketing and outreach, uh, looking at marketing and promotion, um, creating a clear message and really looking at a youth-led outreach plan to engage youth in designing our recruitment and media efforts uh, to help broaden our audience. And so the idea was, how do we engage them in some of this work that we do moving forward? Again, rolling right out in the beginning that we knew we needed data and we knew that we needed help. Okay, next slide. So where we decided to go is that we have a local institution here at SUNY Oswego, and they often take on some additional studies, uh, particularly with their MBA program. And so we contacted their MBA program and we asked if they would consider doing an emerging workforce study for our for our, uh, our group as we move forward. And again, looking at youth residents age 16 to 24, and it really would aim at uh, looking at quantitative and qualitative data to better understand really those evolving conditions that are affecting our Oswego County youth. We wanted to understand the demographics, really look at the scale of what we were seeing, again, knowing what we were looking at, at you know, with 9,000 jobs and potential 50,000 jobs and, and knowing this workforce boom that we were gonna have, we wanted to understand some historical trends on our workforce as, yet, as, as well as future projections to, to help us gain some insight and in, in what we were what we were going um, for. 
Um, and again, just the youth perceptions of those in our community. So that was the, the first piece that we wanted to do was getting a larger uh, study. And the great thing about that is generally when we, we target and we use our MBA groups, um, they um, are within the local community. And so the next piece um, was another study. Again, we, we tapped our SUNY Oswego resources and, and I just wanna share with the group too that these are both ongoing currently. So where I feel like Kelly is really kind of further down the road, we kind of backed up a little bit and just kind of rolling out this plan as we've developed this from our youth, skill, our youth um, system building. And so the part of it where we're the crafting a unified message is we have also as soon as we go marketing and public relations, they have a capstone project that their seniors do. And so what they've been doing, we have two groups, they have about five students apiece and they're a dedicated student team and they're reviewing our website, they're reviewing our social media channels, our print materials, and really assessing the consistency of our branding and our messaging, and then providing some feedback. And so they put together these packages as they review this, again, coming from uh, young folks and a youth perspective and helping us to analyze what we have and then developing some strategies on what we will do um, moving forward. So excited about that piece. So again, we've got the MBA study, exploring the youth perspective, looking at emerging workforce, understanding demographics, and then we have another group of young people that are really looking at our marketing specifically so that we can help to target uh, the youth. Uh, next slide, please. And then the last piece of our, our kind of action plan that, that we have and moving forward is a way to incorporate youth voice. And so this was where we felt that we wanted to reimagine our current uh, youth advisory council and we wanted to make sure that we were engaging youth, we were getting them involved in, in workforce development in a way that was meaningful to them was by hiring them, by looking at paid work experience um, and then in integrating them into our design uh, making processes and helping us to reimagine the work that we do it, as well as rolling out once we receive the, um, the studies and the market analysis is that they can implement those plans and then develop marketing and um, execution of that plan moving forward, right? So we wanted to make sure that the work Work that we were doing, they had a part to play in that. And then that's actually a process that we're looking at currently. So we've we've moved forward with the, the two studies, but then developing that um, paid position is the next step that we're taking uh, to move forward. So we are still, um, next slide, please. And um, definitely in, in more of an ideation stage and kind of moving forward, but that's an overview of our plan and our action plan. Um, and yeah, so if there's any questions, um, I didn't think about this as far as, as I mentioned, we've done a lot of system building in Oswego County and it's not necessarily easy work. It takes a long time. You have to build trust, build partnerships. There's a lot of listening. There's a lot of relationship building that comes with that. Uh, but I think an important part of it is to always have a vision of what it is that you're trying to achieve and talk about that vision a lot, get people excited about that vision so that they understand the goals and they know how they fit into that. And I think being inclusive, making sure that you model the way of inclusivity and bring people in as part of the conversation and recognize what they add. And the last is a stack resources and eliminate duplication when possible. So again, just the things that we're always trying to think about um, in our workforce system. Thank you so much, Chenna, for sharing about Oswego County. Um, there are so many great things happening out of the Youth Systems Building Academy. And as Chenna said, we had a cohort that came from 2023 and Chenna's cohort just ended their um, academy, I believe like end of May. So they are yeah. just getting the ball rolling on all of the great work that they were working really, really hard to propose and, and like strategize. And it's great to see that there's partnerships already being like carried out the data you're collecting with SUNY. That's incredible. Thank you so much again for coming and sharing all the great work. Um, I'd like Thank to you. now introduce our final uh, presentation. We have Krista Tedro and Michael Angelo Rodriguez from South Central Iowa. Please join me in welcoming them. Awesome. Thank you, Namisha. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. All right. We can go ahead and go next slide, please. 
So we are representing South Central Iowa, and um, I'm the former executive of the South Central Iowa Workforce Board. We were uh, fortunate enough to be able to hire our vice chair, who is uh, doing a phenomenal job in that role. So I could switch over to innovation, development, youth programs, which is really where my heart is. Um, and I work now with Pathfinders. Um, and like Kelly and Chenna have mentioned, um, we are probably going to cover a lot of the things that you've mentioned. Michael, go ahead and... Uh, Introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. So my name is Michael Angelo Rodriguez. I'm a youth advocate student in the Atoma community, but also a participant in the wonderful program that we designed. Um, I went to the Job Corps program, and I got the opportunity to go to Washington, D.C., to the YSB Academy. And there, we really drafted up a plan and just started snowballing from there. All right. Next slide, please. All right, so uh, Dr. Nicole was also our coach. You've heard her referenced. Uh, she is with TCG Consulting, is a phenomenal human being, and uh, really helped us uh, design our program as well. And um, Boulder was a part of our uh, design session. Uh, they joined us virtually. So we kind of, uh, it was cool to see collaboration across the cohorts. Uh, you can do things virtually with people in Colorado and in Iowa. So uh, the Atama team really identified key priorities centered around uh, what my friend Shannon just mentioned, and also uh, everyone on the call has, has said this, inclusion, youth perspective, uh, those identities, those experiences. Um, when designing the future of work, we really realized that because we recognized a need for holistic approach, we needed to take um, action in that regard. So we understood preparing youth for future careers is essential just beyond, and it's not just related to the education and training, right? Those are key, yet there's more. And I think you've heard um, our partners talk about that as well. So it goes beyond that. And another key piece that we identified was we needed that lived experience and expertise and really focusing on the choices, identities, um, and life experience that could create more relevant and effective programs, right? heard from the people uh, that we were serving. So when youth bring that unique um, perspective, it, it shapes our insights and understanding based on the history and the background and the challenges and barriers that they face. So our team realized without that understanding, we're not gonna be able to get anything done in a way that's really effective. So we understand that that partnership between youth and adults, uh, there's often a power imbalance and we wanted to really create a place where we were equals in this, we're together, addressing this system. It's no one's fault per se that it's broken, but we're all here to address it and to find solutions um, to find a way to move forward. The other piece of this was that um, in creating that power balance, um, we realized youth need to understand how they can identify uh, changes to policy that impact them. They need to understand how procurement works. They need to understand our system in order to impact and influence it. So there was multiple pieces there. So understanding the strengths and ideas that our youth brought, um, we really focused on that lived expertise and authentic youth engagement, where we created a model that empowered youth and really rather than making them passive participants, they were action oriented and um, empowered practitioners in the system. Um, so it really created this environment where we were able to uh, support one another and created more, um, and is creating more equity. So next slide. So um, I want to read you this, this quote by Glenny e. Martin. Uh, People closest to the problem are closest to the solution, but furthest from the power and resources. Now this quote is very powerful when relating to how there's these programs and systems being designed to help youth, but there's no youth involvement in the process. The youth in the community who are directly affected by these issues, they have wonderful insight, but and, and their lived experience puts them in a strong position to contribute to meaningful solutions. Yet, despite that insight, the youth in these communities, they, they lack the resources, authority, influence, or even the financial resources to begin implementing their ideas. Next slide, please. Thank you, Michael. Um, so we began to think about our imagining the future of Atomo. We, we did have a listening session um, and our approach was to invite youth as partners. And that really came from our Youth Systems Building Academy. Our team went for the first week. We didn't have any youth there and we're like, okay, youth need to be a part of this. So thank you to 
Shout out DOL team. They got us uh, youth were able to participate the next time. Um, and we went back home right away and we sent out um, invitations in, I think, 10 different languages um, to invite youth to give us perspective as partners, uh, because we realize this began with this simple but very powerful idea, right? Real systems change cannot happen without youth um, as active collaborators. It just isn't truly possible. So to transform the city of uh, our future, uh, of our city and our region, we really wanted youth to know that they were taken seriously and were gonna be a key part in our local development. So to kickstart that effort, again, we, we said, hey, let's just get folks around the table, um, have some food, have some conversation and see where it goes. So our, our format included a workshop, uh, interactive breakout sessions. And I think my friend uh, Namisha is gonna share some resources because we've got Canva templates, all the resources uh, are links and you can do whatever you want with them. Um, but really we, we said, hey, we've got to figure out a way to have that conversation going. So we had activities that really empowered um, youth to express their thoughts uh, creatively in diverse ways and uh, fostered some community pride. And Michael will be able to talk about his experience because I can say this, but really he lived it. Um, so that was the intention. Our goal was to do that as we designed it. So at the end of the session, youth were then invited to stay engaged by signing up to be a part of our ongoing efforts, right? So they uh, completed some surveys and uh, their feedback was ensured that we would follow up. So the event was just the start of building a, an inclusive youth-centered approach in our community that could expand and scale regionally um, to empower young people to be active and take a role in creating and co-designing the future of our city. Next slide. Oh, my bad. You're good. <laughs> um, so over 50 youth came to the future uh, of Otomo, including me, and we were finally in an environment where we felt connected with our community and empowered. You know, we we set the stage for the authentic authenticity. We usually, youth are brought down and put down like they're being told what to do or that they're wrong. So we finally had a foundation of, hey, we're here and now we can we can share our voice. And with that, a challenge came up, which was initial skepti skepticism. So the youth are really apprehensive about their opinions and their voice and if they really were there to make these decisions that we were talking about. And so that was the initial challenge was the apprehensiveness that came with the voice in the youth. Um, the solution to this was the transparency, you know, really being authentic with the youth and propelling that confidence and trust through encouraged actions. And that led to building a foundation where we could co-create with one another. Uh, lessons learned, we we had the, some lessons learned where we tailored activities to specific age groups, um, really incorporating that variable and knowing that different age groups respond to different issues differently. And, and we also expanded the multiple languages to include more participation. Next slide, please. All right, so then um, from this, we realized youth wanted to be active in their uh, per their purview, and they wanted to have the opportunity to be part of the community. So um, from the Youth Systems Building Academy, our Youth Community Co-Designer Academy, uh, how original, was then um, iterated. So uh, we liked this idea of being students together, both adults and youth and others uh, just involved in our community. So we're all here to learn and we're all here to be part of the solution. So our, our youth at the last day of our Youth Systems Building Academy all wore a shirt as they presented their ideas uh, in front of a huge room that said, we are the ones we've been waiting for. And we truly believe that, that we are part of um, adapting and uh, transforming these systems. So the purpose of our co-designer academy was really to educate um, our community and equip youth with the tools needed to become active co-designers in Ottawa or in any community. So again, a simple but impactful strategy, youth take the lead. Now, I say that it was also a little bit messy because we're not used to that either. 
So um, with that, youth uh, co-wrote and applied for two grants to fund the academy. Uh, they also hired uh, their authentic youth engagement coordinator, and they were part of the interview panel, uh, part of designing the questions that were going to hire the person that would be helping to facilitate this experience. And um, they had resources uh, to be paid. So we also um, were able to pay you the stipend for participating um, and being active in the program. We justified that through a, uh, a labor I, like cast. I'm not probably supposed to promote anything, any type of thing that you can utilize or system you can utilize to showcase why you should be paid. A reasonable wage for their experience and expertise is important. Um, so with that, um, we then, had weekly sessions where youth uh, were involved with project learning, project-based learning, hands-on projects. Pro they learned about project management, um, learned about being an advocate, being able to meet with um, elected officials to really identify the challenges they were facing, um, to identify policies that were um, harmful or um, inhibiting uh, to youth. So with that, our youth really began to realize that they are active participants, um, and Michael's going to talk more about outcomes. But overall, uh, we directly partnered with several different community organizations um, on projects. We identified opportunities for revitalization in our community, and um, youth began to really see they had authority and they were empowered to make decisions and that their voice mattered and their actions mattered. So um, that then, I think, fostered accountability and passion to go deeper in their commitment to stay in our community. Um, in rural communities, we really struggle with retention and um, with folks staying. We, we see a lot of folks leaving. So overall, um, it gave us an opportunity to not only have youth be investing in themselves, but in the broader community. Go ahead, next slide, please. Okay, so outcomes. I can personally talk about this because I, I went through this. So we were paid to co-design the academy, and that really reinforced us to go out and be do participation and be engaged. But along with that, we were involved with the hiring uh, process of the Authentic Youth Engagement Coordinator. This really put the stage for, like, we're here and we're doing this program. What do we want to do and who do we want to hire? Who can we really connect with? So being part of that was fantastic. Um we were invited to present in front of boards and committees. Now, this was kind of nerve wracking when I went because I've never part, I've never presented in front of a board of directors and being in, in the room, you know, in front of authority asking like, hey, can we do this and this? It, it was really nerve wracking, but it was an experience that really got me ready for the next one because that wasn't the first time we went to present. This is what we're doing and this is what we want. And in doing that, it, it really launched that confidence in us. Um, that led to us launching the a city youth council. So working with the the city council that already that's already established in Tamaiwa to voice the youth voice and concerns and actions that they want to do. Um, some challenges we faced was the sustainability of the engagement coordinator role. Really finding and allocating funds to keep that role of the authentic youth engagement coordinator. Um, there was skepticism about paying you to co-design their own experience. So this is like a pioneering program. There's never been a program like this before. And so there was some skepticism going into it, like, are we really going to pay youth for them? But it was worth it. Um, some elements were really technical for younger youth. So when we tackled systems or, you know, policies, some of the words or some of the ideas were a little hard to grasp for the younger youth. And that that was that was a challenge we faced. Um Solutions, uh, we created an MOU with two organizations to sustain the role for the Authentic Youth Engagement Coordinator. Uh, we used labor market information to justify the payment. And when it came to navigating roles and systems and policies, we made it more simplified so that the younger youth can grasp the concept. concept. Um, lessons learned. So we, have, we, we learned to align re uh, funding for requests for certain projects or initiatives. Um, Ensuring youth are involved through the whole review process, not just the beginning, the middle, and the outcome, but really present and there to input along the whole process. We understood that co-designing is a little messy and it takes time and sometimes it can be all over the place, but when pieces start coming together, it all, it all comes together. Uh, we had a lot of support of the, of the community. This was very vital. 
Um, when we first started, we were like a pioneer program. We didn't know what the outcomes were going to be, but we knew we wanted what we wanted to do. And seeing that support from the community, hey, oh, I've heard of you guys. Oh, you you guys are doing amazing. That really propelled us to even do more. Um, and we needed someone to focus on facilitating the, facilitating the authentic engagement. So we had the authentic youth engagement coordinator. We just needed a little a little bit more there. Uh, next slide, please. All right. So um, when I think about a couple of things, I want to underscore or uh, continue to elaborate on what Michael mentioned is Ottumwa passed an ordinance. So they now have a youth city council where youth are required to be on every committee or commission um, within the city and then have a representative on city council. So we talk about youth voice uh, really mattering. We got it to the point where at a local level, we now have youth uh, it's required that youth are involved and they have a vote and they have a representation in our in our city. So I think that that's a really important thing. And I don't know how much more. I mean, there's a lot more we can do because one of our youth asked our lieutenant governor came to, to learn about our program. They said, hey, well, we did that here. When are we doing that at the state? And I was like, oh, hey yes and he said well i think we'll well he's um retired now so anyways we'll ask the question we'll keep asking <laughs> um so when we think about uh some next steps or what what are those advice just start right so we heard um from our colleagues um it's it's just it's starting right so this work for us a we've been doing it for a long 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 time and then ysbg came in and helped create this um vortex of like magic and possibilities. And so um, it can then continue the momentum. So don't get caught up um, in, oh my God, there's so much to do, or oh man, I don't even know we need a strategy to have a strategy to have a strategy. Begin. Um, look at where those opportunities are to collaborate, um, build those relationships, reach out. Um, you just heard, uh, I think Boulder was saying, hey, we've got a lot of relationships that maybe we hadn't had before. Um, so it's got to start somewhere. Why not with us? Um, systems transformation, again, I think both uh, of my colleagues mentioned this. It doesn't happen overnight, um, but it also doesn't need to be fully planned to just get going, right? Um, so the process will continue to evolve um, and ensure that you have youth there um, as you begin. Michael, can you talk about real opportunities? By the way, Michael's yeah, getting definitely. paid for today as well. So that's important to mention. <laughs> yeah. So really, an advice is really providing authentic youth engagement. I know we say that a lot, but I, I mean it where it's not just an opportunity for the youth to feel good or feel like it's okay in the situation or position they're in. But creating an opportunity for the youth to express their ideas, take on their passions and, and what they see in the community and what they want to do, taking on leadership roles with responsibilities that have lasting and visible impact, it, it, this helps ensure that the programs and the systems change are relevant and they're designed to serve the people that they're meant to serve. But I, I've, I've, my, my life has changed so much when finally people have asked me, hey, what's, what, are, what's your input? Hey, what should we do? And in doing that, it's opened up a wide range of opportunities for me to allow that and pass it on to the other youth that are coming. They're next up. Um, I want to talk about a little bit more about the boards and committees. I know um, we have all these people that sit on boards and committees, but eventually who's going to take their spot? We need the, the new, the new people coming in. And so really opening that that door and saying, hey, did you know you could do this and you could do this and do that, but providing real opportunity to the passionate youth that we have in today. Thanks, Michael. And I think too, when we talk about building partnerships, um, it goes on to show, um, you know, schools provide educational leadership opportunities, businesses offer those real world experiences through mentorship and internships, nonprofits um, are helping and our community organizations are creating those safe supportive spaces for youth. And then again, our elected officials, the folks that are um, responsible for policy making, um, for uh, designing and understanding how programs can help and support. Um, and one of the things I wanna mention is um, youth, when we, we wrote a grant because we were asked to apply for some um, discretionary funding uh, from an idea that youth had because they had the opportunity to connect with an elected representative to say, hey, um, what does that look like? And I'm not talking about WIOA funding, by the way, I'm talking about, we had someone reach out to us because youth came and said, hey, we're here because we care and we want to talk about what youth need in communities. 
And youth wrote a grant for a $1 million building to be renovated because we have no youth space that is open year round and that is open after school um, for youth to, to gather. So we think about a long lasting impactful experience that youth will be able to drive by years and years and years from now to say, hey, I was a part of building that. That's huge. So when we think about these partnerships, um, we're forming authentic relationships where every voice and especially youth is valued. When public and private sectors unite, I really believe, and when we, we connect at that local, regional, and national level with our, our government aligning and saying, hey, we're all here to show up, we create a young uh, a community where young people are valued, where they can thrive, where they're empowered to lead, and their ideas shape that lasting change that we're looking for. I do truly believe that together we all share responsibility for building a better future. And when we do that, there really is no wrong door. So I just want to thank everyone for being here um, and being a part of this. And we're done. I want to thank everyone too for this opportunity. If, if you want to know more in depth, my experience, and because there's a lot more we did, we didn't have space to include in here. So if you would like that insight, you know, you feel free to email me and ask. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, Krista and Michael. Um, thank you for joining us and like sharing your experiences. This is incredible. We have some really great questions that we'd like to have you answer, if you wouldn't mind sticking around for a little bit. Um, the first question that I think a lot of people would love to have answered is, how could this be implemented in more rural areas? Because I know Atuma is only one of the countless rural areas in the country. Sure, so I think we're looking at how we can expand this. Um, one example is that uh, Michael and I are working with the city of New, oh gosh, I can't remember. I'm working with a lot of cities, right? We're working with a lot of folks, but we've been asked to come and facilitate those listening sessions, right? Communities want to be able to hear. So that's one example of ways that we can share what we've done and then help communities strategize on what they could do to launch, right? And that means Michael gets to come along as a consultant, as a paid consultant, to talk about the system that he's transformed in his community and then begin to empower other communities and youth um, to begin to start this. Um, I do believe that if you want it to be sustainable, it's got to be homegrown and from the ground up because this program is meant to be iterated and it's not going to fit everywhere, but we can find ways to co-design. Um, so I think identifying the ways that funding streams are available as well, and that's in one of the resources that uh, Namisha put out, but there's lots of different ways that you can find ways to blend and braid that um, to create a role that can um, support a program designed like this. Thank you so much. Um, could we please go to the next slide? Thank you. Well, again, if you have any um, questions, please reach out to Krista and Michael. They're very gracious and all of our speakers are very gracious to share their um, time and uh, emails with you all. We'll go ahead to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, Right now, we'll kind of have a little brain break, but if you want to, please put all of your questions in the chat, in the Q&A box. Um, we would love for uh, all of your questions to come in so we can ask all of our communities at once your questions. But before we move into general Q&A, and while we wait for your questions, I would just like to share some recent technical assistance that the Department of Labor's Employment and Training Administration has created. First, Obviously, we have the great YSB Academy Compendium. Um, Lillian shared that with us today, and you can access that through the link in the chat. I'm sure somebody will put it in soon. Um, our team has also recently published an LGBTQIA plus webinar sharing innovative strategies from state and local workforce professionals and nonprofit entities. Some of the um, projects that were involved in creating this include the Ohio Department of Jobs and Family Services, the Los Angeles LA Rise Youth Academy, and the Trevor Project were all um, included in this webcast. So I highly recommend you can go check it out now. Um, another recently published resource is the Wage and Hour Division's Child Labor Compliance, Keeping Young Workers Safe. This webinar provides a comprehensive understanding of child labor regulations, including permissible work hours for minors, prohibited jobs, and common compliance issues. And lastly, um, we have another recent webcast called Serving Youth with Psychiatric Disabilities. 
This webcast provides workforce development practitioners like yourselves who serve youth and young adults with the tools to know when mental illness rises to the level of a protected psychiatric disability, how to best serve youth with a psychiatric disability, and how to help youth with psychiatric disabilities thrive in workforce development programs. And we'll, we will be sure to drop all of the links in the chat so you'll be able to access all of these resources. I'd also like to mention that the Employment Training Administration um, is coming out with a new webinar, an upcoming webinar that we will be hosting sometime early next year about community service as a workforce development, um, leveraging funding as a core model. And we would love for you all to share your ideas on what technical assistance you all would like for us at the Department of Labor to provide. So please stick around till the end so we can open the chat and you all can let us know your feedback. Um, and we can go ahead to the next slide. And I think Jermel is going to start launching the first poll. Yes, thank you, Nisha. Uh, we're gonna, we're gonna go ahead and launch um, a Zoom accessibility poll here. Um, so please take a moment to provide your feedback on your experience with today's webinar tools. That first question being, did you experience any technical difficulties during today's webinar? And then a section for a short answer, if you could uh, add some detail, if so. And then third, did you experience any accessibility difficulties during today's webinar? Um, and then another short answer section as well. And again, I hate to sound like a broken record, but I can't stress enough the importance of sticking around uh, after the Q&A for the last webinar feedback poll. We would love to hear your feedback, so stay glued to those seats uh, to share your thoughts after. Thank you again for your responses and participation. Uh, back to you with Q&A, Michelle. Thank you, Jermel. And I'll wait for everyone to have a chance to answer before I go into the first question. We'll leave this up for maybe uh, about 20 more seconds. It looks like a lot of folks are still answering, actually. Again, this is to help us improve your overall experience. So we really do appreciate your feedback. We're gonna go ahead and close the poll now. Thank you, Jermel. All right, so I have a question from, let me find out who asked this question. Oh, I believe it is from somebody named Terry. I might, or I'm sorry, Jalen. Jalen Graves, she asked a question about, um, what methods do you have to include youth with disabilities? Um, I think Kelly Strong, would you like to answer? Because I know that you said that you're implementing your program in an alternative school. So I think that that would be really helpful to hear your experience with that. Yeah, I think the first thing that I would say to answer that is we have a really fabulous disability program navigator here at Workforce Boulder County, and he has been very engaged in our, he has, wasn't part of our initial YSB team, but he's been a part of our listening sessions um, and having him there, not only to be able to support any youth with disabilities who have come to these sessions, but just to kind of remind us about things that, you know, we need to think about and as, a, as an advocate for folks with disabilities. That's been really helpful to kind of keep us on track and to make sure that we are, you know, providing materials and resources that are accessible. Um, and I think the other thing is going to youth, like I mentioned in my presentation, um, has been really helpful as well, because these are spaces where youth of, you know, all ages, all walks of life, all abilities are able to go and be a part of these communities in their own right. And then us just showing up there takes away that like transportation barrier, which was something we definitely dealt with when we were asking youth to come to us. So I would say, you know, making sure that you're making considerations for accessibility. And that's just another benefit of going directly to youth where they already are rather than asking them to come to us. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, and for any other communities, Chenna, Krista, Michael, if you would like to answer that question, feel free. Um, if not, I can move on to the next question. The next question we have comes from Erica, and she asks, and this is for all communities, um, how do you get employer buy-in when working with Opportunity Youth, particularly justice involved and youth aging out of foster care? And any community can go ahead and answer. 
Um, I'll take that. I think that um, it's a great question. And I think that the way that we're engaging is when you're bringing youth along with you, um, that's the best way you can do it, right? I can say whatever I'm going to say once you hear Michael speak up, because Michael's had some involvement with those systems, you see and hear from Michael. Um, so I think that bringing folks along with you as you're having those conversations is really, really um, important. Yeah, so um, like how Krista said, really as um, being impacted by those systems as a youth, we're always like told like you can't come along for a ride or you're not right or or sit down, this is what you have to do. But really bringing the youth with you and showing them like it, it's not like that. It's let them experiencing this is how things can be and this is what you need to do to get to this area. But yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's actually something that, that we've done in Oswego County for, for some time. We have three programs where we get board members from our local businesses that sit and mentor. So we have our P-TECH program and we have two early college high school programs, one in information technology and another one in health sciences. And our board members are very engaged in that. So I feel like we've been able to buy, to get that buy-in through those programs and then showing them really what um, what the future, I feel like, of workforce and, and school district partnerships looks like. Thank you so much, Chenna, Michael, and Krista. Um, another question we received comes from, sorry, I want to make sure I have the name down. Oh, um, Jui Deo. So she asks, in all of your um, youth adult partnerships, were youth given stipends to participate? Yes, for ours, yes. In the first uh, initial launch session, uh, we had the stipend of pizza and a good time. <laughs> but aside from that, um, as we looked at the co-design process and things of that nature, uh, we advocated to ensure that we had at least $16 an hour uh, for a stipend for youth to be a part of. And then when we had a more uh, specific program, we had, uh, I think it was a $2,000 stipend for the, the totality of uh, the next iteration of it. I was just going to add that we unfortunately were not able to pay our youth, and that's something that we very much are um, working on in the future. We know how important it is to consider youth as partners and to pay them for their time and to you know be respectful of their time. Um, this is a conversation that we had with other communities at the Youth Systems Building Academy, right, of like, what sort of flexible funding can we find that we can use for that? Because so much of the federal money that we have for working with youth is so limited, right? Like we're not supposed to use it for in-school youth and we can't use it to buy food and things like that. So we've been really seeking flexible funding to be able to make that happen. Um, very much recognizing that, um, you know, youth time is valuable. So what we did instead is we kind of made these cool little swag bags. We had like these work workforce Boulder County bags and sunglasses and stickers and all these fun things that we could, um, you know, purchase for youth. And they were pretty stoked about it, but we've definitely been advocating for making sure that we can, financially compensate them as much as possible. Krista or Chenna, you want to answer or add to the answer? Well, I saw Chenna on, but I was going to say, talk to your foundation since she's at a foundation, but philanthropy <laughs> plays a huge part here. Yeah, I was going to say, so I went and got a new job in philanthropy. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so to bring resources to work. Um, so we, again, just always sharing how important workforce, education, training, all that is. Um, I'm just a you know an advocate there. But yes, talk to local foundations and see if they have, sometimes they have discretionary funds that you don't have to write grants for. Uh, if you can appeal to them in that way, uh, but just look for look for some smaller grants that, that can do some of that work. So. Thank you so much. Um, another question we got from Jewy was, how do you get buy-in from decision makers to involve youth in the decision-making processes and the planning processes of programs? So I think one thing that we did is um, I asked if I could bring youth with me to present to a group of decision makers at a foundation. And at first they said no. And then when I got there, they said that youth don't want to be involved. Youth don't want to. And I said, well, do they not want to be involved? Because I asked if I could bring them and you all told me no. So I think just first it's the 
some of the questions that need to be asked, because then I also said, if you're saying they don't want to be involved and they don't want to be a part, yet you're not creating the space and being intentional about ensuring there's chairs at these tables for youth to come to, um, also who will be sitting in your chairs in 15 years. So have you invited anyone to come along and, or are we telling ourselves a story that's really not maybe true? So I think asking some questions is important and getting curious. I want to add one thing. Um, some of the youth groups that we partnered with have been kind of tackling this work on their own. Um, we have some really great examples of YLA or youth leadership um, academies here in Colorado. And so partnering with them has been really helpful because a lot of the work that they've been doing is specifically that, right? Like creating advocacy around um, how to get youth in spaces with decision makers, whether they are comfortable with that or willing to accept that or not. And so I think helping to support and facilitate the preparation for youth to be in those spaces is a crucial first step. Um, you know, you don't want to set youth up for failure by having them come into spaces where they're going to be looked down upon, they're going to be treated not well, and to not really have that capacity to speak for themselves. So I think that that's like a crucial first step, right, to prepare the youth. And then exactly what Krista had said about making sure there's a seat at the table for them and asking questions as to like, why, why, why do you not want to have youth here? What's your reason? And kind of break down some of those barriers in that way. Thank you so much. Um, I think that we are at about time. I can see if we have any other pressing questions, but otherwise we can end the Q&A and move on to the next slide. Thank you so much, Krista, Michael, Kelly, Chenna. Thank you so much for coming and speaking with all of us today. We are going to launch our feedback poll now. Jermel can go ahead and launch that. Um, and we just want to know what you all thought about today's webinar. Please let us know so that way it helps us when planning future events and webinars for you all. Um, and we'll also open the chat now so you can let us know what additional technical assistance topics you all would like to see. If you all would like to hear more about rural youth, if you all would like to hear about transportation, please put it in the chat so we know and we can make sure that we're finding programs that are willing to come and speak and help, um, you know, amplify what needs to be heard to our community. And I'll leave this up for a little bit so we can all get your feedback. Thank you so much for attending.